In the early 1900s, Margaret Sanger was working as a nurse for poor immigrant families in New York. She chose to become a nurse after her mother died from tuberculosis at the age of 50. Margaret believed that her mother's ill health had been caused by birthing 11 children and having seven miscarriages. She noticed similar trends in her nursing work. The women of poor European immigrant families lack reliable, safe contraception, which led to high rates of unwanted pregnancy. Their poverty drove them to pursue back alley abortions, which killed them or maimed them for life. These women would call Sanger to care for them as they suffered from these complications. Sanger believed that unwanted pregnancy was the root of the problem, so she began publishing articles about sex and birth control, which led to her arrest. At the time, a federal law called the Comstock Act prohibited distribution of a variety of material that could be considered obscene. The act targeted books about sex, nude photographs, and Margaret Sanger's publications about birth control. After those charges were dropped, Sanger was arrested again for operating a clinic in Brooklyn. Sanger coined the term birth control and continued to violate the law in order to provide information to desperate families. In 1921, Margaret Sanger founded the American Birth Control League, which was one of the parent organizations of the Birth Control Federation of America. In 1942, the Birth Control Federation of America became Planned Parenthood Federation of America. In her 1922 book called The Pivot of Civilization, she wrote about her belief that a woman's right to control her body is central to her humanity. She believed that every woman should have the right to choose when or whether to have children, that every child should be wanted and loved, and that women were entitled to sexual pleasure and fulfillment. These views were not popular amongst the medical establishment at the time, so Sanger began using arguments from the eugenics movement to convince doctors that birth control served a medical purpose rather than a socially progressive one. She also wanted to expand birth control access to the black community. She started an initiative called the Negro Project, where she enlisted the help of black clergymen and black leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois. In the 1920s and 1930s, black groups responded to efforts to promote so-called family planning in different ways. W.E.B. Du Bois, a sociologist, activist, and co-founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, supported birth control as a health measure for the Black community. Birth control is science and sense applied to the bringing of children into the world, and of all who need it, we Negroes are first. We in America are becoming sharply divided into the mass who have endless children, and the class who through long postponement of marriage have few or none. The first result is a terrible infant mortality. Of every 10,000 colored children born, 1,356 die in the first year while only 821 die among whites. The second result is the senseless putting off of marriage until middle life because of the fear that marriage must necessarily mean many children. At the time, black women were stereotyped as sexually immoral and were blamed for the degraded home life among black people, while white women like Carrie Buck were punished for failing to adhere to white ideals of decency and chastity. It was believed that black women lacked the capacity for these characteristics entirely. To counter this racist image, leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois developed a counter-narrative of the strong, resilient black mother with a duty to raise responsible, clean, and educated children. He supported birth control because he believed that black people of lower economic classes were producing too quickly. He feared that this weaker population would overwhelm the black community and render it unable to fight white supremacy. The crisis was founded by Du Bois and became his pulpit to propagate his racial uplift doctrine of the Talented Tenth. The Talented Tenth were the exception from the mass of ignorant Negroes. The Tenth were locked into having to counter racial arguments about their own race's inferiority while bettering the black race. Du Bois did not disagree with popular stereotypes of black criminality and laziness. He viewed their behavior through the lens of popular science and eugenics. Du Bois argued the Talented Tenth were capable of taking these enslaved Israelites out of their still enduring bondage in short order. W.E.B. Du Bois argued fervently for what he called race organization. Black advancement was predicated on individual action that had to influence the whole. Black representation meant the counter voice to white scientific racism, a threat to the widely held belief of blacks' innate and inferior capabilities. Marcus Garvey, Pan-Africanist, Black nationalist, Catholic, and founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, or UNIA, called birth control race suicide. He opposed birth control because he believed that it was an attempt to circumvent the natural propensity of humans to reproduce. For him, more Black people in the nation meant more political power for the Black community. 
Garvey founded the UNIA in Jamaica in 1914. While W.E.B. Du Bois was popular amongst educated Blacks and white liberals, Garvey was popular amongst poorer Black people for his emphasis on building a separate Black nation and Black racial purity. W.E.B. Du Bois alleged that Garvey was a fraud who was raising money from the Black community without any evidence it was being used as promised. Garvey criticized Du Bois and other leaders of organizations like the NAACP, for the number of light-skinned, white-passing Black people they had in leadership. He believed that their only goal was to assimilate into white society. In 1934, Garvey, the acting president of the UNIA at the time, attended the 7th annual UNIA convention in Kingston, Jamaica. At this meeting, a resolution was presented stating that Blacks should not accept or practice the theory of birth control, such as being advocated by irresponsible speculators who are re-attempting to interfere with the course of nature and with the purpose of God in whom we believe. Garvey was so committed to his ideal of black racial purity that he praised the Ku Klux Klan for their stances on white racial purity and met with several of their auxiliary groups. Eventually, this decision, combined with criminal fraud charges and the negativity caused by his public feud with other leaders, led to the UNIA's decline. When World War I started in 1914, 90% of black Americans lived in the South and depended on agricultural work to survive. Since the end of Reconstruction, policies denying Black people access to public facilities, voting, and opportunity, called Jim Crow, were enacted to reassert the white population's dominance over the formerly enslaved people. An oppressive sharecropping system trapped former slaves and poor whites in an endless cycle of debt without any hope of property ownership. The start of the war meant that many young men were drafted and had to abandon factory jobs in the North. It also meant that new jobs were created in wartime industries. Simultaneously, immigration from Europe and other parts of the world was prohibited or restricted. All of this meant that there was a high demand for workers. Business owners advertised better wages, higher living standards, and fairer treatment to Black people in the South. Between 1910 and 1920, New York, Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia saw a huge spike in migration from Southern Blacks. Philadelphia had an over 600% increase in its Black population. Sadly, these migrants found that the conditions in these new cities were not exactly as advertised. The pay at factory jobs was about three times what one would have made in Southern agricultural work, but the jobs themselves were dirty and dangerous. Housing segregation wasn't legally codified like it was in the South, but local customs meant that many Blacks were forced to live in the worst areas of the city and pay higher prices for rent. Racial tensions culminated in violence and riots as Black people attempted to gain equal treatment. During this time period, the fertility of the Black community dropped. Demographers thought this was caused by declining health conditions in the Black community. However, further research indicates that the birth control movement was gaining wider acceptance. After the war ended, returning soldiers wanted their jobs back and Black men were laid off. They tried to secure menial jobs, but they were beat out by more recent European immigrants. Domestic jobs were always available, but many men refused to do them as they were classified as women's work. This meant that Black women were the breadwinners in Black households. In 1920, black wives were five times more likely to work outside the home than wives of other ethnic groups. The dependence on black women and men to work meant that having less children became even more of a priority. Poor white families were known to have more children and send those children to work in factories to help support the family. Meanwhile, black families had less children and invested heavily in their children's education, not wanting them to work at all. Folk remedies and less reliable methods of birth control were popular in the black community due to the absence of doctor staff clinics. When folk remedies failed, abortion was a common way for poor black women to end pregnancies. Many women in this period died or were left sterile by abortion attempts. The danger of abortions and the sentiment that this was caused due to a lack of medically reliable birth control information led to increased support of Margaret Sanger in the Black community. The first Black clinic opened in Harlem in 1925, and Margaret Sanger was approached by Black groups all over the country to speak at their events. The Great Depression in the 1930s caused resistance to birth control access and information to decrease even further. Contrary to myths that white activists forced birth control into Black communities, many Black medical practitioners worked with churches and service groups to create community-run clinics and dispense information independently of the mainstream, majority white birth control organizations. The mainstream birth control organizations were often frustrated when Black-operated clinics would accept materials from their organizations but still maintain control over what they actually used. Black communities wanted the information but would use it in their own ways to help their communities. 
Still, mainstream attitudes about appropriate uses for birth control were also found in the Black community. Conservatives who opposed it argued that it separated sexual activity from procreation and encouraged promiscuity. Liberals who supported it for medical and eugenic purposes held similar views to those of conservatives and did not want birth control to be used to facilitate casual unmarried sex. This consensus amongst nearly all groups in this time period meant that many clinics would not provide birth control to unmarried women and would require married women to have had a minimum number of children before being served. A 1939 national study reported that Black people accounted for 11.9% of the new patients at birth control centers, despite being 9% of the U.S. population at the time. By the mid-20th century, multiple factions had emerged in the debate around birth control, abortion, and reproduction. Catholics and other religious conservatives initially allied with the medical community to ban contraception and abortion. They were mostly concerned that birth control would encourage sexual immorality. Another factor in their opposition may have been ensuring their number of members could increase. In the early 1800s, the majority of immigrants were Protestant, and a smaller number of immigrant Catholics would often convert to Protestantism upon arrival. It would be in the last half of the 1800s when mostly Irish Catholics would be immigrating to the United States. There were activists like Margaret Sanger who didn't attempt to promote birth control to any one racial group over another. She gave speeches, opened clinics, and provided materials to almost anyone who would be open to listen, which, as we'll discuss in a moment, wasn't always necessarily a good thing. Other birth control advocates were less concerned with the reproduction of poor Anglo-Saxons or Black people and primarily wanted to target recent Catholic immigrants. Catholics were having larger families and could not easily be segregated like African Americans. The earliest proponents of sterilization also wanted to target these groups. The Catholic Church moved to strict opposition of birth control, forced sterilization, and abortion, not only as a matter of faith, but also in an effort to protect their members who were being targeted. Later in the 1960s, when the Catholic immigrant groups had assimilated into the larger white racial population, welfare policies as well as racism would drive sterilization proponents to target mostly Black and Latina women. For Black nationalist conservatives like Marcus Garvey, the focus was increasing the Black population as a means of gaining political control. His arguments ignored the fact that in many areas where Jim Crow laws reigned, the Black population already outnumbered the white population. Additionally, he underestimated the high infant and maternal mortality rates. More births had not always historically translated into more voters or more political power. Margaret Sanger and W.E.B. Du Bois were the most prominent figures on the liberal side of this debate. For anti-abortion activists, the history of Margaret Sanger is used routinely to promote the idea that the goal of Planned Parenthood is to exterminate the black population. The truth is more complex. Margaret Sanger initially aligned with socialist groups and believed that women had the right to limit childbirth and experience sexual pleasure. However, these groups attracted suspicion in the United States after the Russian Revolution. Seeing these trends, Sanger decided that the way to gain acceptance of birth control was to medicalize its purpose and use. He decided to build consensus amongst the medical community that birth control served a legitimate health purpose. The medical community had collaborated with the Catholic Church to ban birth control before, but now they would switch sides when Sanger would present a rationale for the treatments that allowed them to retain professional control over its distribution. But Sanger's success in mainstreaming birth control came at a cost. Sanger embraced the eugenics movement, which was popular with universities, scientists, and political leaders to provide support for her movement. Eugenicists weren't interested in the idea of female self-fulfillment or sexual pleasure, but saw birth control as a way to decrease the birth rates of certain groups of people. W.E.B. Du Bois embraced eugenics in part while rejecting its more extreme conclusions. Many of his justifications for promoting birth control stem from his belief in the talented 10th class within the Black community. Margaret Sanger seemed to agree with this approach. She never wrote about eliminating all black people, but she certainly felt that poor or less educated people in the community should limit their reproduction. Her most direct attacks were against disabled people. She believed strongly that so-called feeble-minded people should be sterilized. She celebrated the ruling of the Supreme Court case in Carey v. Buck, which legalized these sterilization programs. Discrimination is a worldwide thing. It has to be opposed everywhere. That is why I feel the Negro's plight here is linked with that of the oppressed around the globe. The big answer, as I see it, is the education of the white man. The white man is the problem. It is the same as with the Nazis. We must change the white attitudes. That is where it lies. When we first started out, an anti-Negro white man offered me $10,000 if I start in Harlem first. His idea was simply to cut down the number of Negroes. Spread it as far as you can among them, he said. That is, of course, not our idea. I turned him down, but that is an example of how vicious some people can be about this thing. I remember addressing a colored church group once. 
I was staying with a white doctor at the time. They didn't let a Negro doctor introduce me to the people. The white doctor had to do it. That was in Memphis. What hangs over the South is that the Negro has been in servitude. The white Southerner is slow to forget this. His attitude is the archaic in this age. Supremacist thinking belongs in the museum. But even with her belief that white supremacist views were the problem, she was still willing to engage with such groups. For example, Margaret Sanger gave a speech at a Woman of the KKK meeting in Silver Lake, New Jersey in 1926. An anti-abortion rights activist typically point out a quote of Sanger's from a 1939 letter to Dr. C.J. Gamble. We do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out the idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. What does Sanger mean by this? There are two interpretations. Anti-abortion rights activists state that this is an admission of Sanger's true intentions. They state that she didn't want the black community to find out that she wanted to exterminate them. Pro-abortion rights activists state that this is an acknowledgement of the black nationalist figures like Marcus Garvey, who were telling black people to avoid clinics and calling birth control race genocide. They state that she didn't want her true intentions to provide birth control access to be misunderstood. Conservative Paul Kinger describes this tension in an article on the website faithandfreedom.com. Was Sanger plotting to eliminate all Blacks? Of course not. But she was plotting to control the reproduction of Blacks and of the human race generally. She was a racial eugenicist. Was she a racist eugenicist? Be careful. What else can be said for certain about Sanger and race? If the person we're describing here was a prominent conservative rather than a progressive icon, this would be grounds for liberals to completely discredit and outright destroy that conservative. Liberals should consider their views of Sanger and what she has wrought. Marcus Sanger didn't promote abortion, but it's not clear whether this was because she didn't support it at all or she felt it was too dangerous given the medical technology at the time. In fact, the primary reason she promoted birth control was to prevent women from seeking abortions in the first place. Planned Parenthood did not perform abortions until 1973 when abortion was legalized via Roe v. Wade. By that time, Margaret Sanger had already passed away. The arguments about what Sanger believed and meant are an example of how difficult it is to form moral judgments about historical figures. Typically, political sides elevate the figures which they believe bolster their views and denounce the ones who don't align with their current values. The questions around the intent of Margaret Sanger's work and her beliefs are important. The current debate about abortion is crowded by two sides who want to promote a view of Sanger that best serves their political objectives. Sanger was not a virulent white supremacist who believed all black people would be better off dead. But she was also not an intersectional radical feminist who centered marginalized women in her work. She was a woman in the early 1900s who believed that birth control was a societal good and used the prevailing and later discredited theories of the time to promote her views. She failed or refused to understand that the definitions of disability and low intelligence were inseparable from racist stereotypes. She mistakenly believed that birth control, however it was dispensed, was a good unto itself. W.E.B. Du Bois also deserves criticism. He attempted to carve out a space for respectable black people in the belief that their achievements could discredit scientific racism. However, this separation only made poor black people more vulnerable to medical abuse in the decades to come. Women's choices are political, by examining this period of history, we see many groups, conservative and liberal, who are competing to control female reproduction as a means to their political ends. 